In my opinion, the best remedy for trash talk is a brutal knockout, or at least a couple of juicy knockdowns. What is that? Smell that? I think I smell fear. And this little grease ball here. I just passed him in the corridor there. I think I can smell a bit of shit as well. Could that be part of his plan? And down goes O'Sullivan! I run out of energy because I'm going to break you down, slow you down, and then take you out. You think you can jab, jab, grab me all night long? It's not going to happen. I've got a remedy for that. British bookies reportedly made a lot of money off the Ricky Hatton Floyd Mayweather fight. Don't believe me? Then today, I'll tell you about trash talkers who became more humble after their defeats. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, and let's get started! Curtis Stevens In 2005, the undisputed middleweight champion Bernard Hopkins lost to the young Jermaine Taylor, unknowingly throwing the division into chaos. From that moment, champions changed almost every year, but with the advent of the new decade, a new figure appeared on the playing field. The talented and young Kazakh puncher Gennady Golovkin was rising from the bottom and by 2010 had a streak of 19 victories after which he took the WBA belt. From that moment, the middleweight division entered the long Triple G era. Gennady easily had three or even four defenses a year, often finishing off contenders before the sixth round. It seemed that such a remarkable performance deserved applause, but there was one who doubted Triple G's achievements. I'm talking about the top knockout artist, Curtis Stevens. The American began his professional career in 2004 and initially fought in the light heavyweight division, but eventually, due to his lack of size, he moved down to the middleweight division. By 2013, Curtis had only three fights in the weight class, yet he was already placing himself above Gennady. Well, I, to me, he's not that powerful, you know? Yes, he's knocking people out, and so, and so a lot, like, you know? But the big difference between me and him, I got one punch knockout power. I don't have to beat you down, then knock you out, you know? As we all see, him eventually, he has to beat you down and wear you down and knock you out. Besides, uh, What's his name? Hiroshima? I forget his name. The little uh, Chinese guy. Yeah, the normal Hiroshima. Look at him! He's about this big! I'm gonna go in there and do what I gotta do. I'm gonna wash up in his blood. In the same year, Stevens fought the very dangerous Mexican Saul Roman and impressed everyone by knocking out the tough journeyman in the first round. For his spectacular performance and a decent winning streak, the cerebral assassin got a fight with the guy he had spoken so unfavorably about. To his credit, Curtis did not back down from his words, but instead doubled down on his statements. Um, who's scared of him though, right? Ain't nobody scared of him. You know, obviously I've been calling him out, you know. And I'm gonna go in there and do what I do, and show everybody that he's not like that. He's not like that, he's overrated. I'm gonna go in there and demolish his ass. When it came to press conferences, Stevens initially behaved quietly. I believe uh, come November second, he's going to see something that he's never seen before in front of his eyes. Like, you know, I have tremendous power. I'm coming to a fight. Um, I'm not scared, and I'm going to be the uh, new WBA world champ come November second. But once he gained confidence, the insults and threats towards the champion flowed freely. Writing checks that Janari's ass can't cash. And come Saturday, I'm gonna up. There was no turning back now. Curtis faced either incredible triumph and worldwide recognition or a public punishment at the hands of the hated Golovkin. During the fight promotion, Stevens repeatedly claimed he could put the champion to sleep with a single punch, but in the first minutes of the fight, he didn't throw a single significant strike. The reason was the incredible pressure from Gennady. He masterfully controlled the distance, keeping his left hand on his opponent's face and exploding with the right cross at the right moments. Out of fear of missing a punch, the American kept a high guard, but even that didn't save him from the left hook that Gennady used to score a knockdown. End of round two. Realizing the closeness of defeat, Stevens began to act more aggressively but failed to create any dangerous moments. Meanwhile, Golovkin kept adding new elements like painful body punches and intercepting Curtis's jabs with right-handed punches. 
At the midpoint of the fight, the challenger stopped trying to box and started fighting. But Gennady outclassed him even in this aspect. After taking dozens of heavy blows, Stevens started to retreat and hardly responded. And in the eighth round, he almost fell from a prolonged combination at the ropes. During the break, the American's corner stopped the fight, which was more than justified. Andre Rozier had seen enough. Coach Ableton, again, please, not crazy fight, not street fight, please box. Yes, uh, yes, of course, coach, this is my box. After a one-sided beating, Curtis finally realized that there are levels to this game and acknowledged Gennady. You know, I wasn't, I didn't get it too much in the groove, but uh, Gennady's an excellent fighter, excellent champion. Since then, the knockout artist has focused on the quality of his performances and such bold and provocative trash talk has been abandoned as unnecessary. Adrian Broner Adrian Broner's story is a textbook example of how money and popularity can drive even the most talented boxer crazy. Adrian was indeed a gifted guy. As a young amateur, he already had top-level skills and could have easily gone to the Olympics but missed out due to a prison sentence. Upon turning professional, Broner spread his wings and quickly made his way to a title fight in the super featherweight division. In just eight minutes in the ring, the problem became the new world champion and after his first defense, moved up in weight where he won another belt. Thus, within a year, Broner conquered two weight classes but his ego demanded more. So Adrian skipped the 140 pound division and ended up in the welterweight division. The fight with champion Paul Malinaji was tough and hard fought, but Broner won, cementing his status as the top prospect of recent years. It's worth noting that all this time, the American was winning not only in the ring, but also in verbal battles. His funny, sometimes annoying trash talk preceded every title fight and often crossed the line. He's still going to be a world-class fighter. He just loot, get his ass whooped by champions. <laughs> no, see, I, I'm, I'm serious. Um, you know, Pop, I take him serious, but but he's a clown. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna come in with a lot of colors, with big feet and colored hair, and I'm gonna punch his nose red to, for he can fill out, fill out the outfit. To be fair. As long as Broner was winning, it was hard to accuse him of empty talk. But many fans were just waiting for Adrian to make a mistake. In 2013, the problem took a fight with a very tough but not very decorated veteran from Argentina, Marcos Maidana. Throughout his long career, Marcos had repeatedly challenged for titles but always stumbled just short of the coveted gold. At that time, El Chino was on a streak of three knockouts but to most, he looked like outdated material and an easy job for Broner. Adrian felt superior, so he didn't hesitate to mock his opponent in front of the public. After I fuck him up December, December 14th, I, I, I can promise you this, it's gonna get ugly. I'm talking, I'm talking Tyrone Hill, Sam Cassell. It's, it's gonna get ugly, man. It's gonna get ugly, man. I, I don't know if he's faking like he don't understand English, but after after December 14th, he's going to speak English, and and the fight I, I don't think it's going full full 12 rounds. I'm going for the knockout. Thank you. He better be ready. Strap up. The champion also didn't forget about rap, which by then was almost as important to him as boxing. Because. Because I know I'm blessed. I got the skills to pay the bills and I got enough will. My last name could be Smith. In reality, the trash talk and lousy lyrics were just part of the problem. Adrian had no respect for his opponent and didn't believe he had even the slightest chance of success. Very respectful guy, so I gotta respect him. But, but just in 14, I'm gonna beat his ass, though. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna beat his ass. For sure. And then we could be, we could be friends after that, but, but that's gonna happen. But um, I don't go for knockouts, but um, I really feel like I'm gonna knock this guy. I'm, not, I'm gonna be his first stoppage, man. I'm gonna stop this guy, and then we're gonna put his own to the next one, man. But I'm ready, man. Like I said, December 14th, I want everybody to come out, man. I'm going ham. Ham and cheese. Considering the difference in experience, size, and knockout power, Broner should have viewed the situation realistically and prepared thoroughly. But he thought he could box Maidana the same way as everyone else. 
fatal mistake. From the start, Marcos put terrible pressure on the cocky champion and pinned him to the ropes. Adrian kept his bravado, but it was clear he was uncomfortable under such intense onslaught. While the first round passed relatively calmly, at the beginning of the second, Maidana's work paid off and he floored the loud mouth with a left hook. By Maidana, that sticks another right hand! Broder goes down for the first two part! Marcos wanted to finish off the arrogant opponent, but Broner managed to survive and slightly even the score. Starting from the third round, Adrian used his legs at full power and tried to outbox the challenger with movement and lightning fast combinations. Some punches did reach the Argentine's chin, but none of them even wobbled him, whereas Marcos's punches literally scared Broner. Even when El Chino punched to the body, Adrian would cringe and step back, afraid of ending up on the canvas again. After the midpoint of the fight, the problem finally relaxed and started working more freely. But Marcos reminded him to stay focused by scoring a second knockdown with the same left hook. This episode completely broke the American's fighting spirit and he no longer made any active attempts to move forward while the tired Marcos easily worked to the fight's end, winning it by unanimous decision. Even after the beating from the veteran, Adrian continued to call himself one of the best, but did give respect to his opponent. I'm okay. You know, it happens to the best of them, and, and, and as of, even as of right now, I'm still one of the best. I want to I wanna congratulate Team Madonna. Madonna, he did a hell of a job. Enjoying the sight of Broner's falling, many haters lost all interest in the boxer. And although Adrian remained a narcissist, he decided to abandon such provocative trash talk. Victor Ortiz Until 2011, most fans saw Victor Ortiz as nothing more than a solid journeyman, and they couldn't be blamed. In his seven-year professional career, Vicious had over 30 fights but never touched a championship belt. The only chance to win even an interim title came in 2009, but as mentioned earlier, Marcos Maidana knocked out Ortiz in the sixth round. After that fight, Victor managed to come back and fought five times without losing a single bout. For this, promoters rewarded him with a title shot against the undefeated Andre Berto. In reality, the organizers just wanted to pad Andre's record with another decent name and then put the American up against someone like Floyd Mayweather. The plan looked solid but turned out to be insufficient. Ortiz pulled off the biggest upset of the year by outboxing Berto to a decision win, almost knocking him out. Thus, Victor Ortiz unexpectedly became the WBC world champion and instead of Andre Berto, he got a shot at fighting the unrivaled Floyd. Vicious understood that he had a unique opportunity to boost his media profile and earn decent money, so he decided to go the trash talk route. I am the current WBC welterweight champion of the world, and that will remain. And I'm going to teach you what it feels like to have that one on your record, bro. No. I have two, so. And two draws. Yeah, you know, two, two, you know. Four. It's kind of happens, you know. Four. Not a biggie, no biggie. Easy. Easy. It's going to be very, very nice, bro, just to. Sit. Do what everybody else has tried and failed. Uh, 41 and oh, I think. So, you know. Uh, um, 41 of those weren't me. 41 of those couldn't move like me. Oh, I'm talking about class here. Uh, somebody's, somebody's scared, but you know what? Saturday night, I will hold my hands up. I'm gonna put you on your ass. In his speech, Victor didn't cross the line and behaved fairly respectfully overall but there was enough confidence, or rather overconfidence, in his words. Hey, Mayweather's a beast, but I'm a monster. So, with that said and done, I don't care if Mr. Mayweather wants to box, I'll box. He wants to bang, I'll bang. At the end of it all, I'm walking around with that championship. Because I am the new WBC champion of the world, and there's nobody that will pry that much in my hands. You keep that in mind. You can keep that in mind. Floyd, of course, wasn't a saint either. 
but at some point, even he wanted to prove to Ortiz that he thought too highly of himself. For this, Mayweather chose the language of pain. Victor was surprisingly restrained and cautious. In the same fight with Berto, he beat Andre solely with pressure. But now he was just waiting and trying to outgun Floyd from a distance. Naturally, in this game, Mayweather has no equals. So by the end of the second round, the champion had taken jabs and, worse, several sharp straight right hands. Floyd realized that Victor posed no real threat. So from the third round, he moved less and focused on landing punches. For several minutes, Ortiz took whole combinations of power punches, but kept standing and later pulled himself together and moved forward. In the fourth round, he managed to catch Floyd at the ropes a couple of times and work with combinations. But in one episode, Victor got carried away and used his head. The referee immediately took a point from him. And as soon as the fight resumed, an unfocused Ortiz took two punches and got knocked down. Of course, you can blame Floyd for lacking honor, but the rule exists for a reason. Protect yourself at all times. After the victory, the enraged Floyd had the now famous spat with Merchant. And taking advantage of what you, know you know what I'm going to do? You don't ever give me a fair shake. You know that? So I'm going to let you talk to Victor Ortiz, all right? I'm through. They put somebody else up and give me an interview. Talk what are you to talking Ortiz. about? What you, are you, you talking heard about? him. You never give me a fair shake. HBO needs to fire you. You don't know shit about boxing. You ain't shit! You're, you're not shit! I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. You won't do shit. As for Victor, it seemed that the loss didn't bother him much. Unfortunately, his brief fight became the last bright episode in Ortiz's career. And he went downhill from there. I don't know about you, but I feel a bit sorry for this guy. That's it for now. Did you like the video? Then be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Do you think a knockout can teach a trash talker humility? Be sure to share your thoughts in the comments below.